we're most interested in what happens in our, and by our I mean human, uh, brains when we're happy and sad. And it's a hard question to ask. In the short run, I'm more interested in the biology of motivation, just how does happiness and aversion and sadness affect our behavior. By understanding the brain pathways, we'll have a better understanding of exactly how reward and punishment and aversion work in the brain. In the longer term, I think that if we understand exactly how drugs work to cause addictions, then we might find new ways, chemical ways, of treating addiction. It started in the 50s with electrical stimulation of the brain, and the problem with electrical stimulation is that it activates all elements in the brain. It's not specific. And that's why we and a lot of other groups decided to go to chemical stimulation of the brain with drugs. We've chosen psychoactive drugs as rewarding stimuli. And the reason why we pick psychoactive drugs is that they're known to act on very specific receptors in specific parts of the brain. So it gave us a hint as to where to look in the brain first. A lot of people are asking it now using imaging of the brain, MRI or with CAT scans or PET scans, but you can never get at the cellular and molecular basis of the events unless you actually use animal models. Trying to measure the rewarding effects of a psychoactive drug is not trivial. And to do it in animals, you can't ask them, do you like that drug? You have to find some other way to ask them. Some of the people in the lab recently have started to look at the effects of psychoactive drugs on a very simple animal, a worm called Cinerabditis elegans. You can barely see it with your naked eye, but they know more about this animal than they know about any other animal in the world. What we've been doing is testing whether worms like psychoactive drugs. Nicotine is the active ingredient in cigarette the one that's rewarding. So it turns out worms really like nicotine. If you put a little spot of nicotine on one side of a plate, an agar plate, and let it diffuse towards the worms, they'll all swim towards it and sit right over top of the high concentration of nicotine. Now what we can do is study in a very simple organism where we can do very spectacular manipulations of its genes and its cells, nicotine approach. And the goal here is Will some of the genes and the cells that we describe as important for nicotine approach in worms, will some of those same genes be important for nicotine reward in humans and maybe even nicotine addictions? We have people in our lab that come from very molecular backgrounds working on yeast and other people coming from backgrounds in psychology because they're interested in problems like drug addiction. And so it's sometimes really fun for people with a more molecular approach to hear about problems of behavior and for people studying behavior to hear about uh, solutions on a molecular level. You can't be too broad in science. You can't be thinking about enough things at any one time because many of those different fields will come to bear on your own ideas and own experiments. My number one criteria for taking someone in the lab is enthusiasm. If I think people are enthusiastic about the work that we're doing and have some ideas on their own and are enthusiastic about trying to test those ideas, those are the people I want.